Hello and welcome back to Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Live 2020. I'm Rich Logan, uh, event and content producer here at Automotive Logistics, and you're jo joining me for the final live session of day two, uh, looking at startup supply chains. So it might be the final session, but the green room has been brimming full of energy as, uh, as we set to uh, explore and delve into the mindset of the uh, supply chain. So during this session, uh, I'm joined by some uh, uh, absolute superstars. Um, we have uh, Akin Glass, um, Global Head of Automotive and uh, New Mobility at Kuhn & Nagel, Marco, Va Marco Weishar, Head of Supply Chain Management at Ineos Automotive, and Amy Paulson, Vice President of Logistics at Rivian. So as you can see, a fantastic panel. And uh, here we go. Okay, so I want to kick this session off um, uh, by uh, by go running with a poll because I want you, the audience, to uh, to decide where this session goes. So I'm going to launch a poll now, and I want you to choose some of the key topics that you want our uh, uh, our expert panels to discuss. So we'll be looking at uh, the differences between startup supply chains uh, versus those established players. Um, and just while we wait for those to come in, um, perhaps it's a good opportunity to introduce our panel. So um, turning to you first, Amy, um, perhaps we can uh, have a quick update and uh, introduction of Rivian and, and what's the current state of play with, uh, with Rivian? Sure. Um, so, so good morning, everybody on the West Coast, and then uh, good afternoon and good evening for the rest of the world. I'm Amy Paulson, VP of Logistics at, at Rivian Automotive. Um, I've been with the company about two and a half years, uh, always in the logistics space. We, um, Rivian is, uh, startup is sort of a funny fitting word for us. So we have been around since 2009 um, in a couple of iterations, but uh, our definitive path forward is fully electric adventure vehicles. So we introduced our um, elect fully electric pickup truck and SUV at the LA Auto Show in November of 2018. And then it's been um, full speed ahead ever since. So we are currently in our uh, pre-validation, pre-production uh, builds at our factory in Normal, Illinois, and we are expecting our first customer vehicles next summer. Great, thanks, Amy. And uh, let's welcome to uh, to the stage, Marco. Um, if you can uh, give us a brief intro to, to Ineos and uh, you know, the state of play uh, with you. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Marco Weisser. I'm head of supply chain at Ineos Automotive. I'm now here at Ineos Automotive for about one and a half years, responsible for end-to-end -end supply chain, um, which is really a, a great thing. Um, Ineos Automotive is a is a startup within the Ineos Chemicals, um, a business a business out of uh, 34 different businesses all around chemicals. But we are trying to. I'm very sure that we will get a 4x4 vehicle on the road, but uh, in opposite to, to Rivian, it's a combustion engine, and uh, this is what we will start with, and uh, probably a smaller car, I, I guess, not sure. And um, yeah, the idea was founded in 2017 to have a, to have a real off-roader um, with, um, with a powertrain, uh, with, a, with a valid powertrain and, uh, and a leather frame, uh, which is not uh, not really used anymore so much in, in, in nowadays uh, off-road vehicles. So to really be uh, able to go through the toughest um, areas, and uh, yeah, that's why I am. And what uh, what we are expecting at the moment? At the moment, we are in the prototype phase, so we have our first prototypes out, and they are at the moment not without any kind of predictions. You can see them when they are driving around. The pictures are out, so that's for sure. We are starting the production end of next year, so um, serial production. So that's the date where we are. We are fully in the prototype phase, um, setting up our team, really being, uh, yeah, um, setting up everything what we, uh, what what is needed, and also about, uh, of course, about the sort of production location we have at the moment. Um, yeah, uh, maybe a, maybe a switch in the production location. Nothing is fixed, but we are investigating hardly about uh, what is it to produce our vehicle in Hambach with a very experienced team already there. 
so that uh, the setup of, uh, of a supply chain in, in, in regards of people who knowing what they do will be a little bit less. So that's that's what we are investigating at the moment and where we are. Great, thanks, Marco. And uh, I think you're already uh, touching on a, a couple of the points that we're going to delve into, uh, which is great. And um, then uh, last but not least, Akam Glass, Kudenagel, one of the largest service providers in the world uh, in automotive. What are you doing on the, on the startup supply chain panel? Um, well, first of all, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you guys watching us on the live stream. I'm excited to be with you today. And yes, Richard, you're asking a very valid question. The company has been around for 127 years. So what do we have in common with startups? And the truth is about 12 months ago, we were scratching our heads, wondering why are we not winning more business from startup companies who are consulting us with regards to supply chain services? So we sat down, we analyzed and we adopted and we put together special teams and special services um, for EV startup supply chains. One of our core anchors is obviously our, our uh, significant knowledge and pioneership in lithium ion battery logistics. And I'm part of the panel today to contribute with the experiences from an LSB perspective. Okay, fantastic. So uh, it looks like we're all in the right place, which is uh, which is good to know. Okay, let's have a quick look at uh, how the polls are going. Uh, it looks like the most uh, the most interest from our audience is coming from selecting supply chain and logistics partners. Okay, so let's delve a little bit into that. Um, and perhaps we can say, you know, what do you look for when uh, when selecting providers? So, Amy, Marco, you're both in crucial stages. Um, building up your supply base. Uh, yeah, what do you look for when selecting um, providers and suppliers and partners? Over to you, Amy, I'll first. A, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so, so I'm looking for, at first, some degree of, of preparation. Have you researched um, our unique industry space and our unique concerns and difficulties? And have you tailored your value proposition um, before you approach us with um, a solution to, to one or more of, of those unique issues. And, and there's, um, there's quite a few. So, so sort of take your pick on areas that you can address to get our attention. Um, lack of process, lack of historical data, um, a high rate of churn in our product and in our process and in our locations. Um, Rivian is especially challenged because we have more than just one. So we have ongoing logistics activity at six sites. Um, so, so managing that um, with a very lean team is a challenge. So how can you help us with that? How can you supplement that? And what, um, what, is, your, what is your mind space? So how are you, are you nimble? Are you flexible? Because um, what does not work is, uh, and I think Akam um, was very pointed in, in referring to this, a, a sort of uh, big historical OEM approach um, doesn't fit with our supply chain. So I think it's really admirable to sort of take a step back and take a look at how you can tailor your offering to somebody in our space. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Marco, from your perspective, yeah, what I can add to that uh, so absolutely, absolutely points out what uh, what Amy says. So um, actually, we're looking for a best-in-class supply chain. What does it mean? We need to have best-in-class partners, partners who are interested in us. We are we all know we are going into an adventure. People know it. Uh, the, the company knows it. So when you are a startup, things that are coming that are uncertain, you need to, to dig deep into, into things. And uh, we need to have partners who have, who have the same will to, to do this adventure with us. Yeah? So uh, we are very, very agile where things can change immediately uh, with us. And uh, they have to be the same adaptable than we are. And they have to be the, one of the best in their field, no matter if it's our supply chain partners for logistics services or for digitalization services or for maybe for consulting services or whatever they have, they need to have a proof track of records and the right mindset. This is this is very much important in there. And they need to help us out and they need to have the right setup, the right setup, the right size of the setup so that they can react in that kind of speed that we request. And um, and uh, and uh, and in our size, we are, I, I say the size of Ilias Automotive is we are a startup. Uh, we are relatively small, we grow fast. And um, so we are looking for the people who want to grow with us and for the partners who want to grow with us. Yeah, absolutely. So some key insights there for our audience, um, you know, the service providers, the suppliers and, and providers out there. And uh, uh, 
clearly you're, you're setting the bar high uh, with your standards, which is great to see. And and Akim, from from your perspective, you know, it's this is a two way street. Um, you know, what do you look for uh, when you're targeting customers, when you're engaging with customers? You know, how how can you look to collaborate with them? So what's the what's it from your side of the uh, uh, the uh, the conversation? Well, we are certainly not going in to consult customers with our traditional approach, which worked for many, many years, but all of a sudden it doesn't fly anymore. And it's not that we're just changing the, the sales pitch, but obviously we have done the necessary steps and actions with the background, within the background of our organization to prepare our organization simply to be faster. You know, the turnaround times for RFQs, for example, which, as you know, the cycle times with the traditional OEMs can take months. Uh, with, with uh, startup OEMs, it's much quicker, okay? There, there comes a flash RFQ, and you know what? No volume forecast in the RFQs, no commitments, because simply the startup OEM does know he cannot go back to historical data, so he requires absolute flexibility. And that also requires a significant change in mindset within our organization, you know, that uh, customers always write, okay? And if customer cannot provide the information, we then need to be proactive in order to anticipate what the needs are, and um, walk alongside with the client. So it has been a challenge for us, but again, the reason why we are also here on this channel is uh, to tell the world we are ready, okay? Our ID startup supply chains are ready, dedicated people, dedicated teams, uh, which will run in parallel to our traditional services, but it has not been easy. Yeah, absolutely. So interesting to see that that approach. And you, know, you mentioned uh, agility, and that's something we'll certainly uh, come on to. Um, just a reminder to our to our audience, you, you voted and uh, that's great. Those can continue to come. But if, of course, there is things that uh, you want to pose to our panel, then uh, there is the Q&A aspect as well. So uh, we'll look to keep a track of that and uh, post some, uh, some more stingers to our panel um, who are ready and waiting. Um, so let's, let's move on a little bit to uh, um, agility and speed of change, actually, just popped up as the, uh, the next one. So maybe a nice little uh, segue into that. Um, Marco, let's let's start with you. you know, agility, and I think you mentioned it in your intro about um, you know selecting a, a production site. You know, how is, how is agility different for uh, for Enios and, and a startup supply chain? What's the impact? Well, that's of course a huge impact. This is for sure. Um, uh, I would say we have we had uh, we had in the past the clear supply chain strategy about uh, which which kind of of partners we do and, and how our supply chain will look like. But when we are considering another supply chain location, or let's say production location, sorry for that, um, of course, we need to look about, then, then we are not greenfield anymore, then we need to look to another approach because there is already something here we can have a benefit of. And we need to look that that this uh, that is always beneficial about. So if there is a change, uh, of course, suppliers will probably need to relocate yeah um some of them for sure uh because uh, we need to have the suppliers nearby um for outbound logistics uh, other ports are, are very close so um the whole cost the whole supply chain will, will change and maybe partners are not in these areas anymore um where we have ex uh, ex expected the partners and actually we, we say, and uh, I would say it will not be because of supply chain that we, um, that uh, uh, the, the, the uh, SOP has, has, any, has any impact and also not because of anything else. So um, this is 100% sure and we need to ensure that, that there is no impact. And we had the, the big chance and well, let's see how it will work out. If we, if we really have the chance to, to go there, we will have a, a unique chance to, to have, as I said at the beginning, well-trained people um, where, uh, who, can, who could start immediately on, on our project, knowing what they do and helping us out internally. Yeah? And also about our partners and, uh, and all the material flow, uh, of course, Looking, looking to uh, the options we had, we had before. Uh, we are considering um, in, in in UK and uh, also in, in in Portugal. We would have, would have done everything by ourselves, the whole logistics. Yeah, and if we would go to France, it will look different. Yeah, we need to look to our different approach. Um, space requirements are different, so the whole playing uh, planning in house needs to adjust. Um, 
that, that it's almost for everything. So we are prepared. We need, as I said, we need to be flexible. We need to be agile. And uh, that's all about the knowledge and the team. But this, I think this is another topic. And uh, all, it's all about our partners. And um, well, so far it went well. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, selecting a country, um, you know, less than a year, year out uh, to, uh, to sort of full scale production, you know, that, that screams flexibility to me. <laughs> Uh, and a really, really agile system, you know, perhaps not not seen in automotive before. So, you know, that's really exciting. And, um, you know, Amy, have you have you got some maybe some examples of, of kind of quick decision making that's impacted your supply chains or, or how you've had to react to things? Um, um, I think we take us uh, agility is built into our structure in our in our logistics department and and how we're building out the team um and one tenet of that is is owning the risk so um, anything that presents a risk to execution anything that would be a hurdle to execution um we have subject matter expertise in-house so some of those things would be um our supplier packaging so my colleague was uh, participated in an earlier session um so the so the the determination of need um, and the design of the fleet, we keep that in house because that's exactly one of those things as your parts change quickly in a startup environment, so does your packaging solution. Our trade compliance team is in house so that um, we adapt quickly um, to any regulatory changes and there have been many in the last several years um, that have impacted US automotive supply chains. Um, and. Uh, to some extent, we bring um, our data management in-house, uh, including our transportation management system. So rather than relying on one um, external partner for that, we own that. That allows us to react quickly to supplier changes, location changes, regulatory changes, um, even changes within Rivian. So um, so we, we certainly have partners that assist us in all of those functions, but we keep those in-house. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fascinating there. And, and Akim, um, then from, from your perspective, have you got examples of, of where you've had to be agile? And, and your best practices would have been established and built over many years, you know, over 100 years, as you said in your intro. Um, how, how are you adapting and, and, uh, to accommodate and, and work with uh, startups? Well, Richard, uh, I will share a secret with you because Please I do. started to evolve from being a traditional freight forwarding company to a technology company. And we are a technology provider who happens to do logistics. And there are, there are multiple examples of that, uh, of our digitized services, which we have put into the market. And uh, some of these services are of great interest also to startup OEMs, such as identifying uh, volatility with regards to receive freight um, accuracy on shipping schedules. So we have dynamic ETAs. We are tracking the vessel location of each and every vessel all around the world, every container vessel. And you know, typically these uh, these vessel forecasts are static. You look onto five different websites and you get five different dates, but actually there's a need and plan date, which does not change, but uh, the, the dynamic ATA it has changed due to weather conditions, port strikes, uh, simply vessel rotation because carriers take out a certain port. And therefore, this is one example of a, of a technology solution which we are providing to our customers, obviously free of charge, in order to improve their agility. Yeah, okay. Well, I must warn you that this being a, a global conference, your, uh, your secret's no longer safe, unfortunately. <laughs> it's now with our global audience, but uh, um, that's, uh, that's fine, I'm sure. So um, looking at our, our audience, the poll uh, continues. Um, people, talent, and skills. Um, seems to be high on the agenda and, and people's interest. Um, so, you know, how does that differ uh, at, a, at a startup compared to a, a traditional player? Um, you know, how, how's that unique? And, and what, what do you look for um, when you're building your teams? Marco, Amy, you're, you're still recruiting. Um, and the same for you, Akin, with your new division and your, um, your transition to a technology company. You know, what, what, do, you, uh, what do you look for? when hiring and, and, and building these uh, these futures. I'll start with you, Akin, this time. Okay. Well, we mentioned beforehand uh, the mindset. Uh, and it's it's uh, important to have the right mindset. So, yes, we were recruiting new people for, for new mobility key account management. And actually, first we went out to California and we tried to get people, you know, from the AV startups and also in some European locations 
but we found out that those people have great mindsets, you know, and they know the, the, the necessity of what customers require, but they couldn't really consult our clients because they are lacking the experience of supply chain management. So what we've decided now is uh, that we have six teams around, six people around the world, and actually there are three completely new guys, okay, with limited experience with regards to supply chain management, but they are being shadowed by three experienced senior managers, and they work together as a team of six in order to consult our clients. And um, that's, that works out pretty well, and uh, this is one way how we overcame the, uh, the challenge that we had, that you don't want to send uh, a 55-year-old person you know, to an EV startup where the CEO is 28 years old, and that just doesn't fly and doesn't work. And therefore, I'm not saying that uh, people who have, who have gray hair, such as myself, uh, are no longer wanted within the OEMs. We give the experience because we have we went to the university to the University of Life, but um, it did require um, new people. And with those additional new people, you know, you go to tech talks and you actually learn from what startup companies tell you of what they require. And once you've done it, and once you actually then reached out to those companies, you are you are adapting. You're getting this into your DNA. You're using uh, the same methodology, uh, the same um, the same words, and you understand how they think and how they tick. And again, I hope that the success has proven uh, with our high pickup rate lately of new business that, th that this works. And this is what the customers like and what they want. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as someone who's approaching their 55th birthday, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to know that there's still some opportunities out there for me. Uh, <laughs> So uh, let, let's go to you, Amy, for your, for your take on this and uh, you know, the importance of uh, the right mindset and, and what you're looking for. Sure. Um, in our world, no day is ever the same and, and you never know what challenge is going to come your way during the course of any given week. So we are looking for, uh, when we recruit, looking for flexibility of mindset. So um, those are folks who are innately curious um, in, a, in an interview. They will, they'll ask me about questions maybe outside the function that they're interviewing for. So they want to know, um, a great gold star goes to someone who can ask me about how this function translates or relates to other parts of the business. Um, they're natural explorers, so so they're um, they're not afraid to to ask tough questions or um, explore other areas that where they can where they can improve things, where they make things better, where they can offer support to other uh, other teams. Um, they're not mired in in how things have always been done. Um, that that's kind of a, a death knell in our world um, because you can't move forward fast together if you're just worrying about your ten yard target. It, you, you have to have a more expansive view. Um, and they're they're comfortable with ambiguity, but af not afraid to take a risk to try something different and. If it, fail, if it fails or doesn't work the way that we planned, it's not crushing. You just sort of dust yourself off, um, get up and you try again, and you keep trying until you, until you find that right mix of things and, some, and something works. So really it's an adventurous uh, uh, personality type, I think. Yeah, great, thanks, Amy. And, uh, and, and Marco, um, your perspective, please. Okay, um, well, first of all, I have to say, we are still recruiting, we are not at the end, we are still recruiting in Germany, we are recruiting in UK, we are still recruiting in Portugal, so that's, that's going on and uh, we're looking for the right candidates. So for everyone who is watching, feel free to have a look to our open roads if you're interested to make this kind of adventure. Um, I have to say this, but um, what, what, what is it about people, talent and skills? Well, let's say in EOS we are, a, I would say, Looking to the to the turnover the the company in EOS have to the number of people we have we have really a little people for 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 our turnover that means that the people we have in our team need to have a a, a large knowledge about what they are doing because we are just taking as many, as many people in our teams as we need and if we need extra experience extra extra advice we take it from outside temporarily yeah. So, so the people we have permanent in our team that they have to need really, really a good, uh, a good experience about everything. But experience is not everything. So, actually, um, we are uh, looking for team players. We are looking for the people who are open-minded, and team player is very important. So, I would say people who have not that much experience but are great team players and and bring in fresh ideas are more worth. 
than, than, than having the, the large experience behind. Yeah, this is for sure. Um, I'm, I'm really, and because we are recruiting in, in all these countries, I would say also uh, a diversity is, is, in, is necessary. Yeah, not, 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 in, not even gender, coming from different industry, coming from different, uh, different experience in the past, maybe cross-functional going into supply chain. And that brings in the knowledge. And, and when the people talk to each other, not only thing, but understanding that there are different opinions. And at the end, and at the end, we are able to, to, um, yeah, to also to, to come to a conclusion without being, I would say, upset because another person has another opinion. No, this is normal. We need to challenge it. And, and then and then when the people when the people discuss and we, and, and we are getting to this quick decision and and I would even say uh, even say we have a decision yeah sometimes it's wrong well and it's wrong yeah it's okay but we made a decision and and and, and we have the experience and we have the guys on board who want who, who take on the ownership so the people we have they need to be flexible take on the ownership and as I said they have need to have the build to go with us into this adventure we are, we, we, we are having. So that's what I can say about people. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, yeah. Well, that's interesting. And I think um, there's, there's an important message there from for our, for our audience and you know, anyone in the market uh, you know, looking for an exciting opportunity. Um, you know, that's why we put these, uh, these events together so people can network and, uh, and explore these opportunities to, uh, to connect, collaborate and, uh, and find new uh, new opportunities there. So thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I, I might even find myself at a startup because I, I don't have experience. I don't have the knowledge base, but it sounds like that as long as I'm adventurous and enthusiastic, uh, you know, I might stand a chance. Yeah. Good talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll be bottom of the queue, I think. So let's, uh, let's jump, uh, let's jump around a little bit and, uh, and look at technology. So, uh, Marco, Amy, as you're starting um, and building your supply chains, you know, how do you future-proof um, your supply chains? How do you select the right technology to move forward? It's, it's uh, advancing at an ever-increasing rate. So how do, you, how do you make sure that it's going to be relevant and the right one when you go live with your launches? Let's uh, start with you, Amy. <laughs> Te technology is um, so admittedly uh, an area that uh, in my current role, this has been a huge learning curve. Um, so how do you select the, the right technology? Um, I, I, my, my magic eight ball um, isn't, uh, isn't very good at predicting the future. So we're um, in, in all the EV companies I've been a part of, uh, technology selection has been sort of trial and error. And the big debate is, do you build it yourself? You know, we, we tout that we have this you know, clean sheet and we can create from scratch, and, um, but, but you still have to have a roadmap in your head of, of you know, where you're starting and, and what you need to get to. And there's a lot that you won't contemplate along that path until you're sort of faced with it and it's right in front of you versus um, a more established technology solution or, or system that has um, the benefit of you know, being in the marketplace for, for years and having the benefit of experience of many customers. And but then you're constrained a little bit into into process of, of that solution. So um, in the companies that I've been a part of, we've sort of gone back and forth between selecting something off the shelf and customizing it a little bit or building entirely from scratch. And to be honest, we're still on that journey. We have a combination of both in my current role. Um, and it's not without its difficulties, but um, also enormously empowering. So I have, I have a grand vision for visibility for my parts, for my vehicles, which are enabled by these great telematics. Um, but I have no base base level data. So I have to build everything in between over the next couple of years. Um, and that that is the challenge. But in, in terms of selecting technology, some of it is selected for us. So the telematics that come with the EV, um, there's great things that we can do just by what engineering is building into the vehicle in terms of yard management and geofencing, um, servicing the vehicle. Do we need to do anything while it's in transit? It's going to tell us. Um, so, so it revolutionizes our outbound logistics process. And then inbound, um, we're looking at some new things too because we have that clean sheet. So 
RFID, is that the solution? Is Bluetooth, which is more passive, a better solution? But I think one of my colleagues stated in an earlier session, that's today's tech. So what does it look like five, 10 years from now? And trying to predict that when you're making the capital investment now it is the challenge. So I guess to sum up everything, um, for us, it's trial and error. And we're using a combination of both. Um, and it's really our, our experience that in the past that's sort of guiding us on the path forward. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Akin, maybe uh, maybe I can ask you. And and your title um, includes uh, head of uh, global automotive and new mobility. So you must be you must have a magic work uh, uh, a magic eight ball that works. You must have the crystal ball um, and can see what's coming in terms of technology. Well, you know what? Um, I would like to to highlight maybe two things. One. Um, also, the technology which um, the LSP is using for our internal communication is super important, you know, because mm. COVID, everybody was at lockdown. And uh, Kühn Nagel, we have our own in-house cooperation and collaboration platform. So every Kühn Nagel employee is connected with each other and you can create teams and groups. And also you can share knowledge similar to LinkedIn. And that is something that has been built over years and constantly advancing with new uh, features that you can deploy being a single employee when you look for information for example how can i get get access to that information so sharing knowledge is um, super important in our company and therefore we are deploying technology which we control in-house in order to make sure that people um, can learn fast and they can, we can scale that um, benefits for our customers um, we haven't spoken about this at all in this panel is sustainability um, and so with regards to sustainability, we are providing solutions to our clients, not just to select the fastest carrier um, or the cheapest carrier, but to select the carrier which is actually producing the least emissions uh, during voyage. We know that carbon footprint is massively impacted by sea freight shipping and automotive startup supply chains also still rely a lot on, 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 on sea freight. And therefore, this is another example how we are using technology for the benefit of our customer. You know, you want to be green and, and you can also be start to become more green um, um, by selecting different vessel options. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know, sustainability, I've seen a, a question from the audience, which we'll come, come to in a, in a second. But Marco, maybe just on the technology front, I uh, just wanted to come to you. Um, Technology? Are you are you insourcing or are you outsourcing your technology requirements? So what, what's happening at Ineos? Well, our technology um, it's ready to supply chain technology. It will be mainly insourced. So um, we strong we strongly believe that uh, that uh, cloud based solutions uh, regard relating systems is is the best way. And we are at the moment really in the last stages selecting the right systems uh, cloud based, which we can easily connect hopefully easy connect with plug and play solutions to, to the RP system here, yeah, the devil is in the detail, but if we don't make this experience anymore, and once you miss the chance um, to, to take it in from the beginning, you, you will, uh, I would say it will take a long time that, that you have the, the ownership about that. Um, so when we look about system is of course MES system connecting to AGV, it's container management system even, yeah, do we have a pull or a push system, yeah, BMS, yard management, the track and the trace piece, this is, um, yeah, something, um, something very important connected to the TMS, what about the procure to pay part? Uh, and most, most of the headache sometimes is about, yeah, the service has been done and uh, now about how it's been paid. Was this a great price or not? And um, so we are looking to the, also the procure to pay process, like to optimizing the freight, yeah? To make an optimizer. We have a demand and, uh, and, and how, how can we combine it so that, that, uh, that milk runs can be, can be done and how can we, um, yeah, so, so optimize it and the supplier provide the right number of parts, what we really require and um, production planning, material planning and, and uh, most, I would say, not less important is the SNOP piece. So SNOP planning, looking about what, which other vehicles to be built within the next six weeks to 18 months looking all the capacities within the supply chain from the suppliers to their own manufacturing uh, facility. Of course, we also there have a customer demand that all needs to fit together and we need to, we need to bring the right vehicles um, uh, from, from our production line and bring it to the customer. So that all needs to be, uh, I would say, plug and place and, and uh, I would say a seamless uh, process flow 
uh, without even touching it normally if it if it's going if it's going well as i said uh, a very good vis uh, visibility and then we are um, looking for the right partners working together with the system and to and and to to connect through the system or work with the system and uh, here we are also open for any kind of proposals for that so I'm, I'm, I'm one, I'm, the more, the more, the more and more the world is going to cloud-based solutions with API and everything like this. It's easy to sometimes um, also change sometimes the technology and also uh, being being the owner of it. I would say this is the future, and uh, this is where we like to go. Yeah, fantastic! Some some great uh, great thoughts and insights there. Thank you. Let's uh, let's go to the uh, the audience question that came through um it's not directed to a particular uh, one of you but um focusing on sustainable supply chains how do you choose supply chain partners from essential direct parts to indirect items like packaging so perhaps one one for our oems there um, Maybe we can broaden it out a little bit um, to this, the importance of sustainability and, and the opportunity when you're building something from scratch to uh, to ensure that you have uh, or you meet those uh, ever increasing important environmental goals. Um, Marco, let's uh, let's turn to you on this one. Yeah, well, for packaging, especially when we talk about um, reusable packaging out of out of plastic, well, we are a chemical company. We are producing the the raw material for the packaging. Um, for sure, uh, for sure, we also want to have a, a really good and sustainable solution for it. So um, we already made an agreement um, and uh, have a contract now with um, with uh, packaging that is having 50% regrind material. So we use we take used material to put into our packaging. And, and uh, so we are, we are trying to have the sustainability as most as possible. And also collapsibility and space demand within the, uh, the, the, the packaging is very important. And also the footprint that it fits into, into standard trailers. So, so looking at the overall picture, we made a calculation about what is the most sustainable piece and we, and we took the right decision to take. That's, uh, that's uh, at the moment the stage yet. And I would say here more to come. Yeah, absolutely. And Amy, anything to add on that? Um, you know, I I don't want to be duplicative of an earlier session where we talked, um, or my colleague Jake talked quite a bit about our um, sustainability initiatives and packaging. Um, mm -hmm. But I would I would say that uh, Rivian it, it takes the sustainability um, issue very seriously, and we are, we're looking at ways. Um, with our, you know, we're a little bit challenged in, in that selecting a supply base when you're a startup before you're in vehicle production, um, that, you know, that, that has challenges in and of itself. Uh, are we making novel parts maybe that, that never existed before and, and finding the supply base that can handle that? Um, so I would call this like a first iteration of partner selection. So as, as time goes on and we begin to produce vehicles, we'll look at uh, are the suppliers located in a place that reduces carbon footprint or um, can, we, can we receive shipments from them with a regular cadence that allows us to use lower carbon initiative or uh, methods of transportation? Um, and then everything that comes into the plant from, from food to packaging to um, the, the indirect products that we use as we manufacture. How are we recycling those? How are we, um, we are committed to making that a zero waste facility. And then how can we give back? Are there maybe things that we can do as a company that, um, that you know, uh, bear, moves the needle a little bit on not turning us from, from consuming um, in the carbon space, but maybe to to regenerating or being or being a, a contributor um, to the to the environment in a positive way. So um, that's all very vague, but I'm a little bit constrained in what I can talk about because a lot of these things are under development. But um, but but that's it's at our core uh, is 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 sustainability. Yeah, that's that's completely understandable. You know, as, as a as a startup, you're sort of just building some of those things. So um, we'll just have to have you back on the on the show or at the next conference when you can reveal all those secrets. So uh, we'll uh, we'll book you and sign you up for the next one. Um, and and Akim, I also have some some important news to share because you cannot talk sustainability and leave the LSP. Uh, and so really Akim. So we obviously take this this matter extremely extremely. We take it extremely serious. Um, 
And to walk the talk, um, you, you may or may not know that all of our global LCL shipments, and we are the largest LCL shipper in the world, we're the largest NVOCC in the world, is already carbon neutral. We are offsetting all these emissions automatically by default for all of our customers. And subject to a certain threshold at the end of the year, you will get your certificate, which then identifies those are the kilometers traveled, those are the, the tons of emissions which you have produced, and here's the certificate how we offset that. And um, in addition to that, we as a company, we are already carbon neutral and we are extremely proud about this. And um, we started 10 years ago by setting our own emission targets, but it was not yet required. Today I receive an RFQ on my desk and there's also a section about, dear LSB, tell us about your sustainability activities, which go beyond, we are, we are collecting uh, cups uh, in the canteen, but what do you really do? And uh, when the largest LSCL company in the world is offsetting all its emissions, that's bottom line impact and we do it because we believe in that yeah absolutely and uh, you know uh, a key point to make there so thank you uh, thank you for sharing that so as we uh, as we draw to the uh, draw towards the end of the session i'm sorry to say um maybe we can um just start collecting some some final thoughts but uh uh you know i wanted to just touch on on one other area um around data and, and legacy systems um being a, being a startup, where do you get this information from? And Akim, you know, where do you begin when uh, when you've got over a hundred years worth of data to, to recall on? Um, you need some sort of supercomputer to go through that. No, but it's not supercomputer. You know, in, in the past, companies came to us and they said, "Can you do a network optimization? You know, optimize what we have has been in place for a long, long time." And actually, one of our services, which we have now developed uh, for during COVID and post COVID, is actually um, the business continuity and scenario modeling, which is also heavily backed up, obviously, by by technology. That is what is required today. You know, we don't optimize anything for a startup EV supply chain, but what we can do is obviously we can we can we can model the certain things subject to big, big, big data where we have access to, which we share also with customers. Uh, we collaborate also with customers, obviously, to ensure that we that we don't uh, just run around in the fog, having no idea where in which direction we are heading. So I'm, I'm pretty confident, this is what I meant before, you know, we go beyond traditional su supply chain solutions into value chain solutions for all of our new mobility clients, because that is what you are in customer, you know, the, the customers who are, who are buying an electric vehicle, uh, that's what they expect. And, uh, and we are singing the same song. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Amy, Marco, from, from your perspective, data, um, the lack of legacy systems in place, mm -hmm. uh, how, how, are you, how are you working? How are you uh, building your supply chain? Yeah, I can, I can remember when I started uh, the lack of data we have to calculate anything because, uh, of course, we want to know what will be our supply chain cost, but without knowing about how it will be packed, without knowing what is the size of the parts, how many parts we want to have, how many variants we will have. Yeah, uh, as I said, what the supply base will be and how many days on stock we want to have probably because of this. So, actually, we started like this. Yeah, we look. Uh, we look we went with consultants did like this actually it worked uh, it was it was it was amazing that when three people stick their heads together and, and est estimate something and says well how many days on hand should we have an average in our in our in our uh, in our facility and uh, yeah uh, um, what is the, the average delivery frequency from a supplier and how this is actually packed and how many cubic meters we have in total for for the car and actually, it was not far away from that what we have now, one and a half years later. So, um, of course, um, target costs change when we are considering changing production locations. This is for sure, but uh, you need to be, uh, as I said at the beginning, you need to start with something and it is evolving. It's always iterating. It's always iterating. If you always need to start with an estimation, then look if it is going good. You need to go with the, with the next assumption and then it's always the data is, is, is improving and getting better and better and better. And so this is the way we're doing with it. Yeah, this is a lack, a, a lack of data, but on the other side, a lack of systems at the beginning where you have the freedom of choice to, to, to look what is best for you. I would say this is a kind of freedom you have uh, you have in the opposite way. So I would say, yeah, it's a, some kind of risk, but is it a risk? 
Well, um, what happens if the, if, if, uh, if the warehouse space is too large? Would you have calculated? I, I never heard that. Yeah. Um, if it's too small, I think there are many people who help out. So actually, yeah, you need to be confident. And I think, uh, yeah, that's how we need to go. Yeah, you need to, you need to take a risk also here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and Amy, from your perspective? I think Marco captured it perfectly. Um, so, so if I, I, I yeah. he's speaking my language, and I'm really glad to hear um, him say that a year and a half later, their 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 approach worked, because um, that's I'd say we're on a very similar path. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of his, uh, historical and legacy uh, data and systems that we don't have, but we can't let that prevent us from moving forward um, to to the point of execution. So we fill in some of that gap with um, with experiential analogy. So I, I'm supremely lucky to work with an experienced team who has um uh they're either their mindset is is geared towards a startup supply chain or they have experience in this realm and so um we just well this you know uh i've seen this kind of something similar before and and this has worked so so let's try this to fill in some gaps and then there's some industry data that's sort of readily available or partners can help provide some analogous data and and that's how, what what we use to move forward but it is Marco's right, it's very much trial and error, um, and it's very much an iterative process. Um, so what we started with two years ago is not true today, um, and we'll be much better in, a, in another year than we were um, right now. So uh, it just, it's just marching forward and having that, again, Marco's right, confidence um, that, that you'll, you'll get where you need to go, um, but you can't, you, can't be, um, you can't be held back by what you don't have today. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, the, the questions are still coming in. We're we're pretty much at the end of the the session. I've already overrun slightly, so I've lost my gold star. Um, but uh, but I want to finish with uh, maybe just a final thought. So even though this is going to be available on demand for our audience to rewatch, you know, if, if they can take away one one key message, um, you know, what would it be? And uh, maybe I'll start with you, Akin. Oh, you catch me by surprise. A key message at the very end. Well, keep enjoying the show. Everything which I mentioned to, uh, to the esteemed audience over here is also available at our virtual booth. And uh, again, thank you for having me. I truly enjoyed this. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Akin. And, uh, and Marco, a final thought from you? Yeah, fa fa famous last words of this show. Yeah, I would say I really enjoyed it. Uh, that, was, that was another great, uh, great event here. And enjoyed it with you, Akim, Amy and you, Rich, together. That was, that was great. I would say, yeah, if you do something, do it uncompromising. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do it with, with your heart. Do it full speed and, and believe in that it will, it will take place and then you will have success. That's the only advice I can give. Yeah, that sounds like a, a great message. And then, uh, Amy, you get the, uh, the final say of the three. Oh my. No pressure. No, no um, pressure. I think I think I would say um, you know startup supply chains are not one size fits all. Um, they're chaotic. They're undefined. They're not for the faint of heart. Um, they induce in great amounts of anxiety, but uh, but they are just tremendous learning experiences and tremendous partnership experiences. And um, this panel's been fantastic. And I, I would like, just like to note that you know when I started in in uh, startup supply chains eight years ago. Um, there was not this acknowledgement in the automotive industry and with the service providers that we were different. Um, and that's definitely changed. And, and that's a great thing to see. Um, so with that, I just, it's been fantastic being a part of the panel. And I thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you very much to the, uh, the three of you. Uh, I think we could have gone on for quite some time, but uh, it's getting late in, uh, in Europe. And uh, Amy, I'm sure you've got a busy day ahead over on the West Coast uh, of the US. So thank you again to the three of you. And uh, yeah, we hope to, hope to have you back on the show soon and enjoy the rest of it. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, goodbye. So that's the end of the, uh, the live content for today, uh, but you can continue to use the Brella platform uh, and, uh, to network, to visit the eBooths, uh, where there's some really cool giveaways and, and competitions taking place. Um, so definitely check them out. And of course, you can also check out the content from day one, now available on demand. You just have to remember to uh, click the uh, the past content box in the right hand corner of the schedule tab umbrella to access that. So um, any issues accessing the uh, the past content, just get in touch with the team and we'll be able to help you out. So while you all take a breather and get stuck into that, we'll be finalizing the preparations for day three, where we'll be talking about India, EVs, commercial vehicles, 
North America, logistics automation, supply chain reinvention, and much, much more with the likes of SCA, Nissan, Honda, Glovis America, Volvo Cars, Ford, Scania, Ma uh, MEN Man and uh, Truck and Bus, Daimler, and we're capping it all off with an exclusive live fireside chat with Bo Anderson, President and CEO of Yazaki North America uh, and Central America, and also President of Yazaki Europe and Africa. So clear your schedules, you'll not want to miss out. Thank you again for joining us and we'll see you very soon.